adrenaline rush. I mean, think about all of us. We, you know, maybe some of you are in that phase where you love to, you know, speed drag race and run down the highway. You know, we, we went through that when you're in your teens. But if you're in your mid twenties, you're looking for a ride. You're like, okay, I'm tired of driving back from every time from Chicago to Africa. You want to take the train, or you want to you want to hop in, hop in someone else's car. What happens? The happiness was changing. When you're a little kid, it's Legos, it's dolls, it's a little fire truck. I just bought my three-year-old uh, a fire truck yesterday. I've been telling him for so long, you know, and he, 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 was, doing, he was being a good kid, so I took him to the store, talked to us, and bought him a fire truck. You know, he's so happy. He's coming and showing to all his parents, and, he's, you know, uh, and his parents, and his granddad, and, and everyone, and he's like, I'm going to get you one too, and so forth. And he's telling me, I'm not going to be able to fit in here. I said, it's okay, you have a fireman. He said, but where's the fireman? He didn't come with us. I said, well, you're the fireman. Then he started asking how I'm going to fit inside there. So you have these weird conversations. But you have to figure them out. You never thought. You know, I never really even thought about these type of questions that they ask. But nonetheless, he is happy with that. Now, if I brought this, if you all gave me, he said, you know, thank you, uh, you know, uh, Imam Ali Madin for coming from Chicago, and we would like to honor you with a fire truck. <laughs> how would I feel? <laughs> but you said, no, but you just said you did that to your son. Obviously, you like that. So we decided as the MSA and the, chair, and, the, and the association here to give you a fire truck. That would obviously make someone, uh, you know, not very happy. Because there's an age, a certain age for everything. There's an age when you like fire trucks. There's an age when you like dolls. There's an age when you like trucks. There's an age when you like Legos. There's an age when you like to play in the sand. There's an age when you like to ride your bike. There's all sorts of things that you like to do in different parts of your life. As you grow up, things start changing. It's now about you know, getting the hairstyles, getting the right shoes, getting the right pair of jeans, being in with the crowd, correct? As you move forward, maybe it's for some trying to be doing real good in school. Others, it's just about attracting, you know, attracting friends, trying to get a girlfriend, trying to get a boyfriend, whatever the case may be. That becomes a phase. And then eventually it's about getting the best job. And eventually after that, it's about earning the most money. What, what, te what, tell, what does that tell us? If all of this was the true source of happiness, how come it keeps on changing? If all of it was the true source of happiness, how come it keeps on changing? Because the source of happiness and the goal must be one. And it should be achievable to all human beings. See, this is the key difference I'm probably sharing with you here. Is that the key of happiness we believe? Who cares what type of zip code you come from? Who cares what type of ethnicity you come from? Happiness should be possible for you. You understand? Happiness should be available for you. It's not that, well, I was born in an unfortunate part of, of Chicago, so now I have to lead a terrible life. No! Happiness can't be, that's not fair. Happiness be, should be something that is readily available to everyone. So you have to change the definition of happiness then. And happiness can't be changing in your life every one year. That's, that makes no sense either. Goal posts don't change. Every one mile, you don't keep on changing your GPS. Yes, the milestones change. You pass different exits, different gas stations, but the destination change remains the one and the same. <coughs> so, happiness has to remain the same. What is happiness? It is about being connected to a higher being. This is what we do. That the soul, the happiness comes from the soul being connected to God Almighty. When a person realizes that I am a servant, not of my, of, of, and a slave of my desires, nor am I slave of society, nor am I slave of cultural norms, nor am I, am I slave of what my friends think of me and want of me, and I am a slave of a supreme being who treats all his servants equal, regardless of where they were born, what country they come from, what language they speak. And that we're all on one level playing ground. And he does not look at our faces. He does not look at our bank balances. He does not look at our names. He doesn't look at our father's occupation and our mother's occupation. He looks at our hearts and our deeds. That's the prophetic saying. In Allah, la yunduru ila surikum wa la ila atsamikum. Allah does not look at your faces and does not look at your bodies. No. Amwalikum. Allah doesn't look at your wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty looks at your heart and your deeds. And He's going to judge you based on that. So for a Muslim, the belief is that God created us. God will take away our life. God provides us food. God provides us shelter. God provides us health. Every single good and bad that exists in this world comes from God. And similarly, happiness and bliss in life must also come from God. Otherwise, it makes no sense. 
that God who's got the complete controls of the whole world in front of Him, who controls the death and life of every human being and animal, who controls the rise of the sun and the setting of the sun, how would it be possible that someone else controls happiness? God who controls between the top and the bottom must control everything in between. Hence, the creator of the heart has also created happiness of the heart or the absence of happiness. So if we make God happy, He shall make us happy. And God doesn't just simply happy by prostrating all day and all night in front of Him. Or extending your hands in front of Him praying. No. That's definitely a portion of it. But God wants us to live as a human being in a very diverse universal world. Where you are a citizen of the world. Where you have multitudes of connections with people. And you are being judged by how you interact with each other. That's why the Prophet said, there are, there are two people. One is the one who deals with the people and deals with all the problems that come with dealing with you. And there's another one who becomes reclusive, disconnects himself from class to apartment to class, doesn't talk to anyone, wants nothing to do with anyone, won't help or won't bother at the same time, anyone. So since he remains disconnected, he doesn't have to worry about the problems that people give him. He said, the one who stays with the people, the one who connects with the people and is patient when they speak ill to him or you know, are not nice, which is the normal no, you know, thing about human beings, not everyone's going to be nice. He is much better than the one who decides to take it on his own, alone. That I don't, I want nothing to do with people. I want nothing to do with the community. I want to be on my own. You've seen people in college like that, right? Because they say, why? I'm tired of them. Well, you know what? So am I. And so are you. Everyone is tired of each other. What are you going to do? That's how we are. This is the test of God. To see how we interact with each other. And this is exactly what we're going to be rewarded or punished for. How we interact with each other. When a person makes this decision that whatever little life I have in here, I want to become a means of bringing a smile on other people's faces. I want to bring a smile on my son's face, my daughter's face, my wife's face, and at the same time, my parents, my neighbors, and any random person, whoever I can make happy, let me do it. Because why? The happiness of other people will make you happy. When you make other people happy, you will derive such pleasure from it that's unimaginable. Much more happier than simply enjoying your own meal to yourself. You have to taste it, really. When you have, when you have lunch and there's a person who is seriously very hungry, he has no means, and you give him half of your lunch, for example, maybe it's, it's laughable for us in our, in, in our context. But really, if you ever have the opportunity of doing it, that level of happiness that you gain when you see that person, you know, hungrily going through your lunch as after you offer it to him and thanking you for that, it's unimaginable. You can skip that meal and you'll still be more hungry. I mean, sorry, you'll be still more satiated than having eaten that meal. Looking at the face of the person who was hungry and you helped them out. Those are things that the world is forgetting. Everyone's forgetting. The happiness does not come simply by fulfilling our lustful desires and needs. Eventually, like that person said, you will hit rock bottom, or you want to flip side it, you'll get to the top of it, you fulfill every lust under the world, but you'll still stay with it. Had bin Nazid, is there more? Is there more? And they'll say, no, that's it, that's the strongest, that's the worst, that's the baddest, whatever you want to call it. That's it, there's, there's nothing, uh, you know, more than that. And unfortunately, many people can't turn back when they arrive at that. It's too late. Everyone, by the time they arrive at that level, everyone has given up on them. Everyone has ditched them. May God protect any of us from falling to such uh, you know, depths and to such lows. When a person gets incarcerated many times, that's when, you know, for him, some, for some, that's not even rock bottom, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Then they, they do second offenses and third and fourth. But for some, that becomes rock bottom and they start thinking, and they start realizing that what's going on? Where have I headed? What, I thought stealing was going to give me happiness. I obviously did. Forget about the hereafter. It's already giving me a miserable life right now. I thought, I thought X, Y, Z would give me happiness. All this is not. I'm stuck here. Forget about the life hereafter. I'm already in a messed up situation. So before that time comes upon any of us, not, I'm not saying incarceration, but anything, where we hit rock bottom, we have to start addressing these questions with ourselves. Am I currently happy? Do I have a mission in life? Do I have a goal in life? Do I have a supreme goal? Not just a milestone, but something that I'm headed at. If it is, we should 
write it down. Look at it. And then see why did we come with this goal? Because my dad said, my mom said, my brother said, my cousin said, my counselor said, that's not good enough proof. There's got to be something more, deeper than that. It's got to be something that you've studied, you've thought about. Me, I'm so serious. All of us are just thinking for the next one year. It's this, uh, uh, this degree. I'm just, every one of us is just thinking for the next two years, next year, next year. And beyond that, we have to start thinking. So the first thing, is connecting with the Supreme Being. For Muslims, the perspective is Those who believe and their hearts are connected with God, they remember Allah. Allah will most definitely give them peace. You have the meditations, you have behind me the greatest Allah. That's why as Muslims we're taught to pray five times a day. Regardless of how busy your schedule is, truck driver, dentist, doctor, surgeon, or a student at university. We ought to pray five times a day. Whether it's behind the bleachers, behind the stairwell, in the back of a classroom, in a Walmart parking lot, wherever it is, we take time out five times a day. We kneel, and it takes five, ten minutes, depending, you know, five to ten minutes at least. And we wash up, wash up from everything. Let that stress come out. <coughs> and turn to prayer, put our, our forehead to the ground, and remind yourself that that lab was stressful, that meeting was stressful. That surgery was stressful. That closing was stressful. But you know what? This is an escape. That all of that is the temporal, temporal worldly life. That's not my mission. If things go wrong, so what? Let me look forward to another happy day. As long as I am pleasing my Creator, and I'm realizing that I'm collecting points to cash out in the, in the hereafter, however bad the deal went, however bad the course went, it can't be that bad. As long as... I am in the right direction, I am fulfilling the rights of God, and fulfilling the rights of fellow human beings. Two things, very important. That is an escape five times a day. And not only is it an escape, it is a reality check. If you just prostrate in front of God, you better not cheat on your exam. If you just prostrate in front of God, you better not cheat. The next customer who comes into your store. I share a story with you. When I was going to Kankiki Community College, the only visible Muslim in the whole campus, can you imagine, Kankiki. I had a, a classmate come up to me one day and said, are you a Muslim? I said, yes. Well, she said, you know, we just started talking on different things. And then, ran, I, I, I said, my father uh, is a physician here for like 40 years in the county. He's, he was the first oncologist to come to the county in 1980. So um, she randomly made us comment. And she said, if I were to ever go to a physician, if I, never, if I ever need to go to a physician, I'd definitely go to a Muslim physician. And I was like, well, thanks for flattering me. But why would you say that? Uh, and, and she said, well, I know something about Islam. I said, what do you know? She said, uh, there was an Egyptian person who had come uh, uh, through this website this, you know, that allows people to connect online. Uh, people who don't, who don't want to rent an apartment, or I'm sorry, rent a hotel. Or, what's that called? Couch surfing. Couch surfing. There you go. So an Egyptian exchange student or something like that came for couch surfing. A on couch surfing came to her house and came to whatever he was doing. And she said he played with the soccer, volleyball, you know, joined the barbecues, and went wherever we went. But what was amazing, because we're a Christian family, what was amazing, regardless of what our activity was, he always took time out throughout the day and said, sorry, give me five minutes, and we'll go to the side and pray. 